The Neanderthal man had been on the scene for hundreds of thousands of years due to a slow evolutionary process. According to the Gilgamesh epic, this ape-man is transformed into a civilized being as Gilgamesh's companion on his many adventures. These experiments were probably conducted on this ape-man by the Anunnaki. Wild creatures such as Enkidu live among humans and eat grass. Gilgamesh, then king of Uruk, hears a complaint from an unhappy hunter in the epic. The hunter dug pits to catch wild animals and filled them in. Among the gazelles, he runs and drinks with them. In addition to freeing the game from the traps, this wild man also eats the game. According to Gilgamesh, there is no clothing on this creature, and he is covered in hair. Neanderthals mated with reptilian Anunnaki to create this wild creature. It was hoped that this combination would produce a hybrid that would be better adapted to changing conditions. Desiccation of the earth and its effect on fauna and flora necessitated producing primitive workers. Homo sapiens of today are not the Adam of the Bible. Modern man was created by our ancestor Homo saurus, a hybrid mammal saurian creature. Within a few years, man had evolved quantum leaps. As a wild ape man, he had suddenly evolved into a hybrid called Cro Magnon man. God and man share similar characteristics. Due to his creation in the image of his gods, the hybrid probably resembled a reptilian. God created Adam in both his image or selim and likeness or dmut of his creator, as stated in Genesis 2. Then God said he would make man in his image after my likeness. Many admonitions in the Bible and Sumerian literature have roots in this likeness or lack thereof. After intermarrying with his species, man developed a more mammal-like appearance and became less reptilian. Genes from mammals dominated. Humans became more human as a result of the reptilian genes. Humanity deviated from the basic pattern of reptilian life or godliness through original sin. It explains how man became sinful and fell out of grace. Furthermore, it explains why man was prohibited from making likenesses of his gods. In some scriptures, it is said that some biological experiments went awry on Earth. The Anunnaki or Nephilim infused Saurian blood into existing apes through biological manipulation. Nephilim, who possessed advanced technological means in transportation, communications and biology, was likely to conduct these experiments routinely. Enoch's first book describes in detail the crimes committed by the Nephilim on Earth before the Deluge, and describes them in detail. This text was initially written in Hebrew and Aramaic, then translated into Greek and then into Ethiopic, where it was preserved and not found again by Europeans until the 18th century. There are parts of it in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are the oldest of the three pseudo-epigraphic books attributed to Enoch. By the 4th century AD, this book had lost its importance in the Western Church and only the Ethiopic church considers it canonical. Nephilim were responsible for bringing beneficial arts and crafts to humanity according to the first book of Enoch. The laudatory endeavor soon turned sour. Selective breeding and genetic manipulation were well known to the Nephilim or Anunnaki. The Nephilim taught man martial arts, knives, shields and breastplates. Additionally, they taught many forbidden sciences such as incantation, alchemy, and astrology. But the worst crimes they committed were toying with genetics, such as transforming man into a horse or mule, or vice versa, or transferring embryos from one womb to another. An embryo implanted into another womb is a practice similar to those described in the Sumerian creation epic. According to Genesis, Man was naked in the Garden of Eden before the fall. He didn't realize he was naked until he ate the forbidden fruit and put on clothes. In addition to confirming this condition of man, ancient religious sources also reveal why he was naked. The Haggadah reports that Adam and Eve had been covered with a horny skin, and that Adam's skin was brighter than daylight 
and covered his body like a luminous garment. As a result, Adam had scaly and shiny skin that gave him the appearance of a reptile. Therefore, Adam and Eve did not wear clothing or require it for comfort or protection. By acquiring many traits from mammals, man acquired the ability to reproduce, which is called the fall of man in the Bible. Before the fall, Adam did not sweat in the Garden of Eden according to Genesis. Because sweating is a characteristic of mammals, not reptiles, Adam did not sweat before the fall for eating the forbidden fruit. As long as Adam and Eve remained in the Garden of Eden, they could not reproduce. According to the Sumerian tablets, they were mule-like and could not reproduce their own kind. Live birth is Eve's punishment, and she must suffer its pains like a mammal. The final genetic change was made by Enki. As a result, there was much dissension among the gods, and the issue festered between Enlil and Enki for years to come. Humanity remembers Enki as creator, defender, and benefactor. Humanity was regarded by Enlil as an abomination and a degeneration of the Saurian strain. Known for bringing on the deluge, he was cruel and vindictive. Homo saurus, or primitive man, was placed in Eden to grow food. According to Jubilees, Adam and Eve were responsible for tilling and reaping the Garden of Eden. Adam gathered fruit and food from the garden, protected it from birds, beasts, and cattle. A Babylonian version of the creation of man describes Adam's duties similarly. He was responsible for maintaining canals and watercourses and growing abundant plants so that the Anunnaki could fill their granaries. Before the fall of man, primitive man lived side by side with the serpent gods in the Garden of Eden and performed all the necessary tasks together. Adam, or Lulu, was provided with a reproductive capacity to provide for a larger workforce. Apparently, this workforce wasn't sufficient to do the essential work, so Homo saurus needed to be modified. Biblical scholars refer to this event as the fall of man. It begins with Adam and Eve, who have been placed in the Garden of Eden by the deity to till and care for it. Adam and Eve were told that one of the many delicious things to eat in the garden was the fruit from two trees in the middle, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You are permitted to eat every tree in the garden except for that which gives knowledge of good and evil. If you eat this tree, you will die. They felt no shame when they were naked, the man and his wife. Later, when they ate the forbidden fruit, their eyes were opened and they realized they were naked. Nakedness seems to be the focus of all this attention. Humans became clothed due to Adam and Eve being expelled from the garden. Putting on clothes was merely a manifestation of acquiring knowledge. According to Genesis, the Hebrew stem, id, means not simply to know, but also, more specifically, to experience. About sexual relations, it means to know sexually, that is, to have sexual relations. It can even apply to homosexuality and animal sex, as well as traditional marital relations and clandestine conduct. Man acquired some sort of sexual prowess or fortitude by acquiring knowledge. This knowledge was more profound and severe than just being aware of his nudity. Man needed it, but the creators didn't want him to have it. The Garden of Eden was barren of offspring as long as Adam and Eve lacked it. The pangs of childbirth followed Eve's acquisition of it. As man's evolution progresses, Adam and Eve represent a crucial step, acquiring the ability to reproduce as mammals do. To achieve this, man had to forfeit some of his so-called divinity. The physiological changes caused by Adam and Eve's punishment are only sketchily described in Genesis. Adam will sweat his brow to earn his bread, while Eve will suffer the pain of childbearing. According to logic, Eve and Adam produced no live young, nor sweated before. The event brought about some changes in other religious sources. After the pair ate the forbidden fruit in the garden, the Haggadah explains what happened. 
Their first consequence was that they became naked. In the past, they had been covered with horny skin and surrounded by glory clouds. As soon as they violated the command, the cloud of glory and the horny skin dropped from them, and they stood there ashamed and naked. As a result of losing their horny skin and cloud of glory, they were naked. Old rabbinical legends describe similar events. The skin of man before the fall was described as being as bright as daylight and covering his body like a luminous garment. According to these sources, the immediate result of Eve eating the apple was that all the adornments God had given Adam's bride fell off her, and she saw that she was naked. In other legends, their cloud of glory was their luminous and bright skin. As a result of the fall, their skin became less bright. Ancient documents emphasize nakedness because of some protective outer skin that was luminous and shining, the cloud of glory. The nakedness of man is the loss of this protective horny hide or skin, or, to put it another way, the loss of man's reptilian or divine appearance. Reptiles do not sweat, a physiological function that is unique to mammals. The skin of a mammal would therefore need to be protected by clothing. The man was created in the image of his God from the very beginning, according to the book of Genesis. The man was created in God's image, in the divine image was created male and female. If Adam of Genesis and the Lulu of the Sumerians are fashioned after the serpent God, shouldn't some ancient scriptures mention this? The Gnostic creation of man mentions this. According to one tract, Eve's reaction in Eden was as follows. Her mind opened as she looked at the tree. She saw that it was beautiful. A piece of its fruit was taken by her, and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband, and he ate it. Their knowledge shone when they ate. They knew they were naked when they were put on shame. They became enamored of each other when they sobered up and realized they were naked. It was because they saw their makers as beastly forms that they loathed them. There was a great deal of understanding. The following is a fitting description of Adam and Eve and their creators. The skin of these animals was scaly or horny. It was shiny and luminous, just like some reptiles' hides. They did not sweat, unlike mammals. They did not wear clothes since they were unnecessary. They had pale green skin. According to the Haggadah, Adam was created from dust taken from the four corners of the world, explaining the color of his skin. The dust had different colors, red, black, white, and green. Red represented the blood, black represented the bowels, white represented the bones, and green represented the pale skin. Adam would probably have had pink or brown skin if he had been a Homo sapiens, it is likely that Homosaurus, or Reptile Man, was much more extensive and taller than modern man. Before the Eden incident, he was described as having the stature of a giant in many ancient sources. According to rabbinical records, Adam, who had been a giant, had diminished to the size of an ordinary man. Among the hordes of humanity, the antediluvial patriarchs and Sumerian kings stood out physically by being part Saurians. With the Saurian blood becoming more diluted over time, the Rephaim, descendants of the Nephilim, lived shorter lives. The only taboo tree in the garden was the Tree of Knowledge. Even though it was not forbidden to him, man had access to the Tree of Life or Immortality. The biblical deity was concerned that he might become immortal if he drank from the tree of life. His expulsion from Eden was caused by God's punishment for his sin. What if he could also take from the tree of life and eat? To guard the path to the tree of life, he stationed the cherubim and the fiery sword east of the Garden of Eden. A man could not turn back, according to the scriptures. After obtaining knowledge, he could begin the mammal race known as Homo sapiens. This, however, came at the cost of long life or immortality. It is evident from the book of Genesis that these two concepts were mutually exclusive. 
Seeing that man now required clothing to protect himself from the elements, a sympathetic deity made shirts of skins for the man and his wife and clothed them. According to the Haggadah, this benevolent god probably had another reason. The clothing was made of skin shed by serpents. Man's relationship with his Saurian gods repeatedly recurred this theme and was formalized in the ritual of circumcision. A man was ironically reminded that he evolved from Saurians and existed with the tolerance of the serpent gods. Did this serve as a reminder of man's serpent origins? So far, no Sumerian myth has paralleled the fall of man described in the Old Testament, but one poem contains a story that may be the source. The tale of Adapa is found in Elamana's archives and Ashurbanipal's library. It was widely known in ancient times. Like the Gilgamesh epic, the epic deals with man's squandering of an opportunity for immortality. Adam of Genesis achieved immortality, but not knowledge like Adapa. In the Abzu, Enki created Adapa as a model specimen of Homo sapiens. A statement is made at the beginning of the story. His, Enki's, gift was wisdom, not eternal life. During Enki's water palace, Adapa was trained to carry out specific chores for his household. He procured food, baked, and prepared and tended the dinner table. As the story unfolds, Adapa was out in his boat fishing for food to feed Enki one day when the south wind swamped his boat. A curse was hurled at the wind by Adapa, who broke the south wind's wing, as the story states. The south wind is a strange phrase in the myth of Zu, and given in another Sumerian poem, it is an aircraft wing. It suggests a winged unmanned craft of some kind based on its context. In Adapa's case, it appears that he accidentally disabled it. Meanwhile, An, the god of the south wind in heaven, asks his vizier to investigate why it hasn't blown over the land for several days. An was furious when Adapa reported that a mere mortal had disabled the south wind and summoned him to his spaceship to explain himself. Often in the presence of the great god, Enki was not only man's creator, but also his benefactor and defender. The heavenly ship of An is explained to Adapa. The bread of death is offered to him. Do not eat it. And the water of death is offered to him. Do not drink it warns Enki. According to the account, he took a shuttle from Sipar, the space city, and ascended to heaven. The south wind was broken by Adapa, who was ushered into god An's presence. According to Adapa, he was catching fish for his master's dinner. His boat was overturned by the blast of wind from the apparently low-flying south wind after the south wind came up and overturned it. Adapa impressed An with his intelligence and knowledge of forbidden things, information privileged to the gods and their semi-divine children. In addition, he questioned Adapa about why Enki would disclose the plan of heaven and earth to such a worthless human. He also asked Enki why he had created a Shumu for him. Since Adapa had travelled from earth to heaven in a Shumu, a journey only allowed to the gods, the chief god wondered what to do with him. An orbiting spacecraft is reached by a rocket ship or shuttle called a Shumu in Sumerian. To continue Adapa's story, the bread and water of life were provided to him so he could join the gods. As a result, Adapa would become immortal and be like one of the gods. Reverting to his reptilian nature would mean reverting to his original state. This may have been Enki's reasoning for forewarning him since he didn't want his creation to be tampered with. Inquiring as to why Adapa refused immortality's food and water, An asked Adapa. In anger, An sent a messenger to chastise Enki after Adapa informed him about Enki's warning. Adapa had left it too late. Symbolically, the possibility of everlasting life had passed him by. As Adapa, from the horizon of heaven to the zenith of heaven, cast a glance, saw its awesomeness, he said when he returned to earth. Adapa's story is important as a parallel to Adam in Eden, 
because, like Adam, it was decided by the gods that he would be the ancestor of humanity. Adapa became a high priest at Eridu, and he was promised that the goddess of healing would now also treat humanity's ills. In his decree, he declared Adapa the seed of mankind. Sumerian cylinder seals and murals frequently depict the food and water of life. A pine cone and a water bucket or situla are sometimes depicted as the food and water of immortality in the hands of gods. A man couldn't have the best of both worlds, mammal form and long life. The Old Testament refers to it as the weakness of the flesh. This explains why man's lifespan shortened as each generation diluted the Saurian gene more and more. Man's choice was not forgotten by the gods, who were unhappy with the deterioration of Saurian traits. He became less aware of his Saurian origins as he evolved. Humanity has denied all knowledge of its Saurian heritage through a long process of selective amnesia, abetted by a secretive and self-perpetuating priesthood. To obtain certain metals, our ancestors came to Earth from another planet long ago in the form of reptiles. The Anunnaki became unbearable as the climate changed, as reflected in the demise of the dinosaurs. Mesopotamia's climate was found to be benign, so they established a colony there. The decision was then made to produce a primitive worker better suited to the climate. A half-ape man, the half-reptile creature, was born, called the Homosaurus. However, this creature was unable to reproduce. The first Homo sapiens was created by giving the Adam or Lulu dominant mammal characteristics to solve this labor problem. It seems as if modern man appeared on the scene by magic some 40,000 years ago. A quantum leap in evolution was required for Homo sapiens to evolve from Cro-Magnon man, an ape man. Over the past hundred years, evolutionists have been baffled by the missing link question. Does the so-called missing link have a chance of never being discovered? This missing link is likely to be found in the ruins of ancient Mesopotamia. There was also a serpent living in the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve. A quality that rivals and surpasses Adam's is given to him. A verse in Genesis acknowledges this point, stating that the serpent was the most shrewd of all the wild beasts that God had made. The Haggadah describes the serpent as tall, two-legged, and intelligent. In the Haggadah, there is little doubt that the serpent walked like a man. God spoke to the serpent, I have created you to be king over all animals. The Haggadah reports that his hands and feet were severed. As a result of his role in Adam and Eve's fall, the serpent was severely punished in Genesis. There was no way he could avoid crawling on his belly. The serpent once had legs and lost them. Genesis suggests the serpent once had legs and lost them. In appearance, the legged serpent must have appeared to be a fearsome creature that dominated all the animals and humans. During their expulsion from Eden, Adam and Eve wore shirts of skin. However, since Adam and Eve were vegetarians during this time, and man wasn't allowed to eat meat until after the deluge, the shirts of skin must have been their sloughed-off skin. This is confirmed by several ancient sources. The clothes worn by Adam and Eve were not only made of reptile skin, but also protected them from predators, according to ancient Jewish legends. They were told that all creatures on earth would fear them when they wore them. In addition to reminding Adam and Eve of their origin and serving as a talisman to protect them from wild creatures, serpent skins symbolize the ruling race. Nahash, which means he who solves secrets in Hebrew, is the name given to the creature who tempted Eve. The serpent was viewed as evil during the early Christian period, a relatively recent concept. Scripture often associates the serpent with divine knowledge, healing, and immortality. Translations of the word serpent were complex, even in ancient Greek. Dracon, the Greek word used for serpents, giant reptiles, and other terrifying creatures, is found in the Septuagint, the early Greek translation of the Old Testament. 
As a result, the term dracon came to refer to a giant winged-legged serpent in Western literature and culture as a dragon. Many mythological creatures, such as dragons, are distorted forms of serpent gods. It is a semantic problem created by man's aversion to linking his ancestry to a Saurian god. The serpent's reputation as evil and repulsive has been shaped by two streams of understanding. A master-slave relationship is the first. These spacemen intermarried and lived among mankind as a barbarous and cannibalistic race. As a result of the Nephilim's descent in the days before the deluge, the memory of this reptilian domination was further exacerbated. The man performed all menial and distasteful tasks instead of the Anunnaki. As the deluge approached, man had despised and even persecuted these Saurian offspring. Ancient sources strongly suggested that anyone showing signs of serpent god ancestry was hunted down and destroyed. Enki and Enlil's enmity was the second major contributing factor to their conception of evil. Enlil assigned the Middle East lands to his sons after the deluge, while Enki assigned Egyptian and Indus Valley lands to his sons. Marduk, Enki's eldest son, seized control of Babylon and inherited the title 50 after returning to the Middle East. Serpents are credited with divine knowledge, healing and immortality. Enki is the creator and benefactor of mankind. In this way, the biblical fall of man is a confrontation between Enlil, the Old Testament Elohim, and Enki, the usurper serpent god. In the tale of Adapa, Enki prevented An, who became Enlil as the senior god, from tampering with his creation. Patriarch Enoch was to be given immortality and godhood in the third book of Enoch, echoing this dissension. Older Order angels protested that God was divulging divine secrets to man. They reminded him, Didn't the primeval ones advise you not to create men? Mankind born of woman, blemished, unclean, defiled by blood and impure flux, men who sweat putrid drops, are the words of the minor gods or angels who scorn man in the third book of Enoch. Conservative and older gods regarded man as an inferior animal since he was sweaty and dirty. As the Old Testament emphasizes this displeasure of the angels towards their sweaty and hairy cousins, this dislike is masked with the weakness of the flesh imagery. They preferred the sleek, lustrous and gleaming bodies of reptiles, and mammal characteristics repulsed them. The development of physical hatred toward these creatures is difficult to explain. It is hard to deny the beauty and elegance of the reptile form from an objective perspective. It is best left to psychoanalysts to deal with revulsion. However, we may dislike reptiles due to the lingering memories of our barbarous treatment from our reptilian ancestors. The ancient legends portray man as consistently gaining knowledge but losing immortality along the way. It appears that the two are at odds. Gilgamesh spent a lot of time trying to achieve immortality in his adventures. The tree of life's fruit is forbidden to Adam, but he gains knowledge. Adapa too is denied immortality by Enki as he is given knowledge. Adapa cannot go to the heavens to ask for immortality. Then he is refused it by his grandfather Utnapishtim. Eventually, he obtains the magical plant that extends and heals life, but a serpent steals it away from him, no doubt an image of serpent gods. In world mythology, a serpent symbolizes long life, cure, regeneration and immortality. There has always been an association between serpents and healing. In the Mayan Chilambalam, for example, it is said that the Chanis, who came across the water with their leader Itzamna, were the first inhabitants of Yucatan. He was known as the Serpent of the East. When the tribes were expelled from Egypt, the brazen serpent or seraph, raised on a pole and used to cure their ailments, was illustrated as a healer in the Old Testament. It is rare for ancient sources to mention the duality of knowledge and immortality as represented by the two trees in Eden. Besides the tale of Adapa, 
ancient literature emphasizes man's efforts to achieve immortality and extend life. Middle Eastern cultures often depicted the symbolic tree of life and magical food and drink in their artwork. In contrast, the Old Testament emphasizes man's sins caused by his downfall after achieving knowledge rather than immortality. There is an exception in the life of Adam and Eve, a pseudepigraphic document detailing Adam and Eve's lives after they left Eden. It was written in Greek and Latin in the first century AD. In it, Adam attempts to obtain some of these rejuvenating remedies, a little-known event. Adam was old and sickly, according to the text. It was asked of Eve and Seth to return to Eden so he could be anointed, relieved of his pain, and extend his life with oil from the Tree of Mercy. At the gates of Eden, the angel Michael rejects Seth's plea by arguing that the magic elixir is not for men. Literature and mythology have long explored regeneration as a form of immortality. It is a sub-theme in the Gilgamesh epic where, after telling his grandson that the gods had refused him immortality, Utnapishtim has compassion for his grandson. To avoid leaving him empty-handed, he finds out about a magical plant that restores youth and vitality. Following his grandfather's instructions, Gilgamesh obtains this magical plant on his return home. He takes it back to Uruk and shares it with his friends instead of partaking it immediately, which is somewhat unwise. Gilgamesh makes a mistake by stopping by a pool of water to bathe, and the plant is stolen. Gilgamesh took a much-needed bath to remove the grime from his long journey. The magic plant is left unattended on shore by him. During his bath, a snake, or seru, smelling the plant's fragrance came up through the water and took it away. As the serpent left, it shed its skin. The serpent can extend its life through regenerative abilities by shedding its skin periodically. Science has yet to provide humanity with the panacea for long life and vitality. Humans and higher mammals are not capable of regeneration as a natural process, capable only of regenerating hair, skin, nails, liver, and a few other tissues. It is more pronounced in lower animals, such as salamanders and lizards, which can replace their tails, lobsters and crabs, which can grow new limbs, and flatworms, which can reproduce several times if cut into pieces. Literature often contains references to regeneration despite the gods' prohibition throughout history. Upon stealing the magical plant of Gilgamesh, the snake sheds its skin immediately demonstrating a form of immortality. Through the rite of circumcision, the shedding of skin has entered the theology of the Hebrews and Christians. He is told to circumcise the flesh of his foreskin as part of the covenant between him and his God, which was reinforced by being repeated many more times to his descendants. Man can also be saved by ritually sacrificing part of himself in the same way that the serpent obtains long life by sacrificing and leaving a part of himself. Ancient literature records only two individuals who achieved true immortality and joined the gods. A few people were granted immortality, including Utnapishtim. There is no doubt that the gods granted it with great care. After the deluge, a ritual was performed on Utnapishtim. He was sent to live at the source of the two rivers where Shamash rises, in Dilmun. Noah was not immortal like his counterpart. There were many more jealous and uncompromising gods in the Old Testament. The patriarch who achieved this distinction before the deluge was one of the patriarchs. According to Genesis, Enoch walked with God. Then he vanished because God took him. Although the Bible omits some details, the three apocalyptic books of Enoch provide the complete story. In addition to being immortal, Enoch was also deified so that he became second in power to the chief deity. Due to this unusual metamorphosis, an objective magistrate was provided who presided over the trial of the Nephilim who had been accused of all kinds of crimes on earth.